First one is always fun. There's two people. There's one at the pole and one you saw at the top of the corn, and that's it over here. If you need to move down there, or if you need to go to that tree, I mean, I had this for three more people, so just do what you want to do, got to do, need to do. Put that buggy just anywhere, be all right. You know, West Central Alabama, right here in the Zamapas area, we've turned into one of the biggest dove hunting areas in the country. Just everywhere you look, somebody's got a dove field. When people say that's a Vandy field, you can look at it and tell Vandy did that. If Vandy didn't do it, he told them how to do it, or they saw his field and copied it. So, you know, over the years, it's just all kind of evolved into something that started as a child. The opening weekend, there were more hunters in the field opening day of dove season than I think just about anything else. A lot of folks only hunt that first weekend and don't continue hunting through the dove season. It is a time-honored tradition. A good shoot, good lunch, fellowship, a lot of fun with friends, meet new people. But the interesting thing about having a dove shoot, it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort. A lot goes into having a field that's attractive to a lot of birds and legal. And that's one of the things that Vandy has, I mean, he's the best I've ever seen at being able to fix dove fields. He just knows how to do it, and it's all legal. It's by the book. I doubt there is anybody in the southeast. I'd like to meet someone that works harder than Vandy Collins to create this fantastic dove habitat. It's just beautifully done. I can't imagine the hours and expense that goes into doing it right, but there's a reason he's called the Dove Zone. idea of being a gamekeeper to me is what I do to prepare my properties that, that I own or that I lease for doves. I built fields over the years and, and like everything else, it is an evolution thing. You learn something by your mistakes or you learn something through changes. And so it evolved over the years. It went from brown top to dirt and wheat and we even went to a silage cutter. We go down that road and it grinds that corn up when it's dry and it blows it out here, scatters it on the ground out here. It's got a directional spout. I can turn and blow it this way or that way or wherever. And it takes the ear corn or the head of sunflowers and just disintegrates it, which makes it an awesome tool to create a dove feed. The reason you see me blowing it in these standing sunflowers is a dove feels comfortable when he lands down in this. Now the standing corn over there, I'll turn around and blow the sunflowers in the standing corn. That's really a dual purpose. It's got some shade in there and you'll see those doves in there sometimes at two in the evening and they're nooning, they're shading, they're sitting in the shade. But ironically, while they're sitting in that shade, if there's feed there, they'll peck around a little bit. My whole shoot is about knowing everybody and knowing how much they can stand and how much they can't stand. And I got five or six of them that I'll really, I mean hardcore harass them from the get-go. Mark, in a complete circle it's 360 degrees, right? Well, the sun only covers one small quadrant of that 360 degrees. So if I'm standing in the field, I'm not going to have to have my hand up and stare at that sun when I got 355 more options that I can look. They all know that it's just in fun. I mean, it's just to loosen things up. It's hard for me to do it on a bad dove hunt. It's real easy on a good dove hunt. I try to make you know, a good dove shoot into a comical, fun thing for everybody. Bobby and I, I started taking him hunting a few years ago and We've never done a whole lot together, but the little time we've been around each other, I'm sure he's learned a lot about me, and I've learned a lot about him. Here comes another, here comes another. Bobby's out there, he's real serious with his dog. He's taking ethical shots. He wants to work his dog. There's two right behind us. Well, they look high. You can't do that. A 
dove shoot, it's a southern tradition, and it, it always starts the first part of September, and it's typically pretty hot. And I always, with my dog, and I'm no expert, but I've always kind of used around 88 degrees as the deciding point. If it's hotter than 88 degrees, if there's not a lot of shade on the field, that's too hot for the dogs. But you really got to watch them because dogs will overheat in a heartbeat and especially in that afternoon. So these morning hunts like this are just ideal because it's starting off cool, it's about 70 degrees. Dogs are a lot of fun, but you're the one that's got to be responsible and take care of them because they're not going to stop. they got too much heart. Gamekeeping is built around me putting the right habitat out there. And as my grandfather used to say, you set the table and they'll come. The great thing about these right here that puts me on a really unbalanced playing field with people that don't have sunflowers is the ability of a dove to land on this head and eat the seed out. It can be wet and muddy. People that are gone primarily with dirt and wheat they're pretty much out of the business. The wheat's gotten wet, it's swollen up, and plus the ground's so wet, they can't get their tractor across it. With these sunflowers, a dove can land on his head. He'll reach under and he'll eat everything that he can eat by sitting on the outside. Of course, while he's doing that, he's gonna knock some off on the ground. But then he leaves this center full of seed that he can't reach. And so that silage cutter, I can come down through this row later on in the year and it blows all your seed out there. And so I utilize this part too. Okay, you come in. Well, why are you walking down here? Because I was going to help you pick it up. Go to the mail. I'm going to walk right by you and I'm going to get it to you. Right here, all right. Well, I'm telling you, that's where he fell. If you miss heaven that far, you don't even need to have a funeral. Well, maybe he took a little walk after right I Right here, come. bird, right here. Dog, dog. Well, what are we looking at? Y'all can't even shoot close enough to scare them, Mark. The first time I hunted down here, I thought, God, I didn't know I signed up for Marine boot camp, Andy. <laughs> it's just all part of the show. He means nothing at all serious about it he just likes to you know give you some tough love on how to do it right how to how to hunt doves how to be safe and so i don't mind that firmness so i, I appreciate Sandy's approach well doug finally hit one in the dirt over there and he's so proud of himself he was strutting back to the hay bale he didn't worry about them two or three that flew over him while he was posing You know, one of my great things out there in the field is I'll, walk, I'll pull up there and I'll say, do, do you work out at the gym? Yeah. Do you walk? Do you run? Yeah, yeah. Well, you in good shape, right? Yeah. Well, why are you sitting on that stool? Get off of that stool and stand up. You can see better. You can shoot in every direction. Then I got people that I say, look, man, that dude's brain's only that big. His mama did not teach him the difference in a three-foot man and a five-foot man. That's squatting down. That ain't gonna do nothing but wear your knees out before the day's over. So what I try to do is take a joke and turn it into a learning thing for them to, to tell them a dove sees movement. He doesn't see you. You've got camouflage on. You know, you're out there ready. I just love to aggravate them and irritate them. A lot of them get a kick out of it. So we make a fun thing out of it. And if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't keep doing it. Mark, where y'all waiting on? Was that a hen? Was that a hen? Y'all just, y'all not shooting hens? Look at the dove flying all over. What, 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 all those? I mean. <laughs> now you're telling Doug the wrong place to look because you don't want him to catch up with you. That's what you're doing. <laughs> oh, you got him. And don't come back now, you hear? Everyone lit out there. <laughs> you know they ain't scared of y'all. They're landing on the ground. I've been asked a lot of times by a lot of people, I don't have as much land as you've got. I don't have a tractor as big as your tractor. You know, what can I do? There's just so many ways you can do little things. You don't have to go big, wide open tractors. There is no size limit on having a dove field. Each piece of property has its own identity, has its own personality. You can't textbook write one scenario down and say, here, do this everywhere. It'll work. It's not gonna work.
All right, buddy. Good job. Good job, Copper. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Alabama opening weekend. A lot of birds. You know, as a gamekeeper, if you can have a field and you can, like Vandy's done, and, and manage the sunflowers and the corn and do it legally, attract birds, you can have fun all season long. So I'm gonna say that's a wrap, guys. We'll go get some breakfast. Miss Melba will have something cooking, I'm sure. For somebody that just wants to take their daughter or their son and go out in the back 40 or the back 20 or whatever, there are some things you can do. You can broadcast brown top, which is an awfully good crop. It's a short-term crop and it can be a small field crop but you can even have a neighbor that is in the farming business and you can take your 40 acres and go in and ask him would he come over could you pay him to plow up four acres in the middle of it and you might be a deer hunter also so you take that four acres and plant corn and then you take your bush hog and you utilize that corn to try to have a few doves early in the year and then you've got a deer patch for later in the year i've been asked all my life what is the one most important thing to having a successful dove field and I'm going to say location. If you're not in the right spot, if you don't have doves, you cannot fabricate them and make them be there. You have to be in an area where there are doves, and then you take that and analyze what you've got, how they're acting, and then you plant and build that field accordingly to what you've got to deal with. What drives you to keep doing that? Why do you love every day coming here and dealing with these dogs? I don't know. I ask myself the same question. I've retired several times, but I just can't walk away from the dogs. I just like dogs. I'm a dog guy. Whenever I started duck hunting, I started training my own labs. I continued that all my life, basically. I, I trained dogs when I was in Tupelo, and I was there 28 and a half years. When I moved to West Point, I'm, I moved next door to Toxie Hayes. He brought a lab over and asked when I trained it, and I told him, yeah, just put it in a pen and back of your house, and I'll come over and train every day. But along the way, Toxie said, we need to go into the lab business. We talked about that off and on for, for quite some time, and then one day he said, it's time. We've got to do it. About a year and a half ago, we started building this kennel out here and started from there, started in taking dogs for training and, and raising puppies and selling puppies. This is Bowie. Bowie has been here in training just a little over a month. He has learned heel, sit, stay, and steady to the shot, steady to fall. He's a really nice young pup. We're working him on a, really a combination of things. Heel, sit, stay, and back. Right now, he's at, as you can see, he's at, at heel on the sit command. Son's a little hot, so he's laying down. And what we do is we throw the dummy, and he is not to go get the dummy until we tell him to do so. Bowie, here. Sit command, one roll the whistle. Bowie, back. We like to keep them in a, depending on the temperature, somewhere around 15 to 30 minutes. If it's really hot, 15 minutes. If they can go longer, 30 minutes. When the, the way we can gauge whether the dog needs to quit is if the tip of his tongue turns red, he's, he's heating up, time to quit. You certainly don't want a heat stroke because even if a dog recovers from a heat stroke, he'll probably never be the same again. The best dog I ever had, and my favorite dog, his name was Jet. Jet and I were on the U.S. gun dog team, and we traveled to Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland running working tests, and we ended up winning the Irish International, and we also won the Atlantic Cup, which was just a competition between Northern Ireland and the United States. Even before Moss Oak Kennels was even in our mindset, we were sponsored by Moss Oak, and uh, we have our Moss Oak banner in Northern Ireland hanging on the fence after we won the Atlantic Cup and the Irish International Working Test. He was probably the greatest lab ever had. He was, he was just totally biddable 
and totally trainable. He was a special dog. He's probably what you call a once in a lifetime dog. It makes me very happy to know that people that buy dogs here are probably going to get their once in a lifetime dog because we have produced some fantastic puppies. When I see those, those type puppies that we're producing and coming back in for training and do so well in training, it warms my heart because I love dogs anyway. I've always loved dogs, I've always had dogs, and I'm glad to see that somebody else is getting a dog like I once had. If people take them home and they socialize them correctly and they bring them back for training or even take them to another trainer, the dog is going to end up to be probably their once in a lifetime dog. I'm just happy to see that.